Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. It is that time again where we do a mismatch of all of the different true scary stories. In this video, we will have paranormal. We will have creepy encounters. We will have a mismatch of all the different types of stories. I also want to mention that Inner Scare Wifey and I have started a podcast. If you haven't yet, please go check it out. It's all about the horror industry, how people got their start in the horror industry and what they do. I really think you would enjoy it. The link will be in the description down below. But for now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. This is when I was about six or seven years old. I used to live in a two-story house with my grandparents and my dad. I usually slept downstairs with my dad, but I had a room upstairs next to my sister's room. Most nights were normal, but for a few weeks it was very different. It was an average night. No wind. No rain. It was just about midnight when I heard the metal roofing next to my window creak. I thought it was a bird at first, but they started to sound heavier like footsteps. Over time, they got right next to the window. I saw a dim light shine through the mesh on the outside of the glass. I had watched a lot of creepy ghost videos at the time, so I thought it was an orb or a spirit. This occurred throughout the week. I told my dad, but he didn't believe me. One night, I gained the courage to yell at it. All I said was, I know you're there. Go away. I heard the footsteps run off the edge of the roofing and land on the grass below. At that age, I thought it was a ghost, but now I realize that it was something even scarier, a person. Between 1987 and 1989, I worked at a very popular clothing boutique called Merry-Go-Round, located in the Grand Avenue Mall in downtown Milwaukee. That job in that mall attracted a wild assortment of characters, from celebrities that were in Milwaukee for concerts and films, suburban kids and parents having a foray into the city, to hardened drug dealers who were looking to relieve themselves of copious amounts of extra cash. The recipe for Merry-Go-Round's success was simple. Hire a really attractive staff, play the most popular music, and let the staff flirt their way to as many sales as possible. Every day was an adventure going to work, but little did I suspect how impactful one day would ultimately prove to be. One day, sometime between 88 and 89, I had just gotten off the city bus on Wisconsin Avenue. I walked towards the main entrance of the mall and noticed some scrubby looking guy watching me intently. This guy had on an olive collared army issue jacket, one that looked like it was from the 70s, with very greasy slicked back hair and a very unkempt stubbled face. My immediate thought was that he was probably some homeless wacko, of whom I was immediately dubious. His back propped against the Woolworths that was attached to the mall, and his gaze was disturbingly focused on me. While a couple of paces away from him, he asked me if I had a cigarette, to which I replied, I don't smoke. I passed him in stride, figuring that was the end of that encounter. I couldn't have been more wrong. This dude had come behind me and said, actually, I'm new in town and I'm looking for a good time. I'll never forget the feeling that I had been assaulted. His presence was one that both enraged and disgusted me. I turned abruptly and responded, what the F did you just say? Instantly, the guy turned and walked rapidly away from me. I stood for a moment staring in his direction, shocked and baffled as to what had just transpired. 
I regained my composure and headed into the mall. As I rode the escalator to the second level, I remember vilely cursing under my breath, calling him every manner of names that I felt described him, his audacity, and the situation. In the summer of 1991, I was a soldier stationed in Berlin, Germany. I remember hearing vague details of some nut cannibalizing people in Milwaukee. To be truthful, I didn't pay too much attention to the story initially. I also remember hearing about some new movie that they wouldn't show in Milwaukee because of recent events. I didn't know anything about the movie, so I couldn't connect the dots as to why Silence of the Lambs would be such a controversial film for that city. One evening, I was home watching the news, several months later, and there was footage of Jeffrey Dahmer being led into court. He wore an orange prison jumpsuit. His greasy hair was slicked back, and he had an unkempt five o'clock shadow. In that instance, my mind raced back to the day that I encountered this same man. I was now watching him on my television. From then on, I paid a lot more attention to the story. I learned that the man responsible for getting him arrested was someone Dahmer had picked up at the Grand Avenue Mall, where I worked those years ago. It seemed an irony to me that if he didn't leave my presence so swiftly that afternoon, I probably would have gone to jail that day for whooping his butt. At the beginning of 1992, I decided to pursue a career in modeling. My newly acquired agent called me and asked me if I'd be interested in being in a movie, and of course I said I would. I auditioned and landed my first role in a film called The Innocent that was starring Anthony Hopkins. In late May of 1992, I was on set for the first time. The director, the incredibly gracious John Schlesinger, walked me over to introduce me to Mr. Hopkins, who had just won his Academy Award a month or so earlier for his portrayal of Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Mr. Schlesinger said, Big Tony Hopkins, meet little Tony, me. Without missing a beat, Hopkins shook my hand and stated, Don't worry, I usually don't eat people until after lunch. Of course, I was obliged to recount my Dahmer encounter with him at the time. He had me retell that story to several people throughout the course of our filming. So as far as I know, I'm the only person to have survived both Jeffrey Dahmer and Hannibal Lecter without so much as a tooth mark. Hi. Ten years ago, I was at my grandma's house, in the garden with a friend. We were talking and I heard a feminine voice calling me by my nickname. I thought it was in my head and I didn't say anything, but my friend stops talking because she heard it too. We thought that my grandma was back from the store and I went to the door, but at that same moment my grandma was parking the car, so it was impossible that she was calling me. My grandma's house was really old and it wasn't the first time that my family heard something, especially at the second floor. We could hear footsteps. But I have a question for you. I was talking with my friend the other day and I told her this story. She told me that when this happens, you shouldn't turn around. This is not the first time that someone's told me this. Do you know why you shouldn't turn? Sorry for the long story and English is not my first language. If you're interested, I have other ghost stories. Have a nice day. This story happened around two months ago. My parents had decided that it would be a good idea to allow my younger sister and I to shop for our clothes on our own. They believed it would be a good experience. So we all went to the mall, and my parents gave us both enough money to purchase at least an entire outfit. We decided where we would meet up, and they gave us a time limit as well as advice on which shops to visit. I was pretty apprehensive about the entire thing. I'm a socially awkward, extremely anxious teen, so I was very paranoid of anything bad happening. My sister, who was only a few years younger than me, was pretty excited. She was the most competent with social interaction, 
so I relied on that ability a lot. We both decided to go to H&M since we were most familiar with the clothes. We took some time in there, decided to come back later and left. When we left the store, I accidentally made eye contact with a random guy who was walking off somewhere to the right. I immediately got a really bad feeling about him, which is unexplainable, but my gut was telling me to get us out of there. I started pulling my sister away to the left, since it was in the opposite direction, and noticed the guy make a 180 degree turn and start walking toward us. I get extremely panicked, and my sister finally notices what is going on. I basically tell her to keep holding my hand, and I quickly start walking irregularly between the different sides of the mall, because I wanted to check one, if he followed us exactly, and two, see if I could lose him. He followed our every move. He had no bags, no walkie-talkie, no phone, and he was dressed in very dark clothing that obscured his identity really well. Luckily, we managed to reach the escalator, and we ran down the steps. By the time he reached it, we were already running to a family-friendly store, so we could be around some employees. We didn't see the guy after that, and my parents stuck by us for the remainder of time. I'm extremely lucky to have noticed before my sister and I were possibly hurt. Obscure, blood-like spot appeared after one night spent at a hostel. That strange incident already happened around 20 years ago, when I was 18 and in high school. As for context, I am from Germany, and I apologize in advance for any linguistic mistakes. Our school system is divided into three different types after elementary school ends with fourth grade. Gymnasium. No, it's not a sports school. It's the school type where you can go to university after graduating. In the last two years of gymnasium, we choose two main subjects we focus on and, in the end, write our graduation exam. We also have all the other subjects, but it's not as thoroughly. One of my subjects was German. The classes are normally smaller with around 15 students max, and our teacher stays with us for two years, preparing us for graduation in the particular subject. All students in our German class got along really well with each other. We were all aged around 18 and 19 years old. And we also liked our teacher, around 35 years old and female, a lot, and she liked us back. It was always a very friendly, calm, relaxed, and almost familiar atmosphere in our class. So we decided to go on something like a weekend trip to a hostel, like a month before final graduation exam to repeat all the topics from the last two years prepare for maybe upcoming questions or topics in the exams and just generally strengthen our knowledge in the subject. It's not a common thing to do such trips. We just did it because as said, we studied in a very familiar atmosphere and thought it would also be something like a little goodbye since school would soon be over. There was no pressure. Who wanted to go went and who didn't want to go didn't attend. Since we all were high schoolers, the hostel wasn't very far away from our hometown, maybe an hour or less, and of course, not high class, just average. I can't remember so well anymore, but it was somewhere located in a smaller village. The hostel itself was isolated and surrounded by some woods. All fine as for a hostel, since people mostly use it to sleepovers when they go hiking or they book rooms for seminars for a group. Because we wanted to save money, all the females slept together in one room, also our teacher. Everyone was fine with it. I don't know how it is today, but at that time it wasn't a big deal. We weren't minors and it was just one night. It was a bit crowded, but hey. I can't recall anymore, but I think there were about five to six people in that room. One was one of my best friends at the time. Some of the beds were that kind where you can fold. So, you can also stroll them into the other rooms if needed. All of them were quite close to each other. There wasn't a lot of room to walk around. All beds were sheeted by us when we went to sleep in the evening. All was fine. The night was calm. 
I remember I slept perfectly fine. Normally, I am an early bird. But when I woke up, it wasn't dark anymore. So the room was dim because the curtains were pulled in front of the windows. It seemed the others were still asleep. At least, everyone was still laying in their beds, not moving. There were no smartphones with internet yet common. So there was no chance that someone was just browsing. Since I needed to use the restroom, I silently left the room, not wanting to wake the others. It's common slash was common that there were no toilet or shower in the room, but separated outside in the hallway. I came back and some of the others were already awake, sitting on their beds, maybe a bit groggy, silently admitting it is always a bit weird waking up with others. We greeted each other, you know, just a good morning. And that was it for first interaction. Everybody was minding their own business. Then I realized that extremely weird, almost black, dark brown, red isolated circular spot on the ground between mine and my bestie's bed. I was puzzled and couldn't tell the exact diameter, but I would say that it was around five to seven centimeters. It wasn't extremely big, but it wasn't so small that I wouldn't have realized it the evening before we went to sleep. And it was shiny, not crusted too, which means it wasn't something dry. I did not touch it, but it looked thick. One couldn't see through it, and there were no crumbs or grains, anything chunky inside. It looked purely liquid. The floor was gray or such, so there was a strong difference in colors. That's also why I spotted it immediately. The strangest thing about it was the very circular shape. No smearing, no other stain nearby, no droplets. Like when you let honey dripping on an even surface, something like that. But this wasn't honey for sure. Honestly, at the time, it looked to me like it appeared out of the floor. No drops, nothing. You know, when you see a movie when blood is oozing out of a wooden floor through the thin spare? Like that. Just that our floor was linoleum. There was no way it could ooze out from the floor. There were no gaps. I told my bestie and she got puzzled too. Then I told the others, everyone looking at it weirded out. Our teacher too. The way she looked at us was like searching for an answer. Who maybe did it or who would know its origin? Then I looked up at the ceiling, wondering if it was dripping from there. But again, there were no droplets around, which you would assume when liquid falls down. And there was also no stain on the ceiling either way. The whole ceiling was clean. My second guess was, well, a couple of females in a room. Maybe one was on her period. Of course, I had somehow had my bestie under suspicion because the stain was between mine and her bed. And well, I wasn't on my period. I thought, come on, it can happen, no drama. But then I was wondering, even if it was menstrual blood, how the heck would it be so isolated, so clean with no stains around smearing? And it was really very thick, dark, and big. It's somehow physically impossible that someone on their period could have just leave a stain like that. And I don't think anyone walked around without their pajamas or underwear. It was just impossible to leave something like that without other stains. Also, cups weren't things at the time, so it wasn't possible that someone just emptied it there. And why would they even? If it had been nose bleeding, I guess there would have been some smaller droplets and someone emitting it. That's really no issue to try to hide, nothing embarrassing about it. Or any other little injury. Everything was fine. I wondered if some smaller animal a mouse or something got injured and left that stain there. But also in that case, there would be more smears of blood around, I guess. I mean, that injured animal would have needed to go somewhere. All of us were puzzled, and since I am rather on the rational side, my assumption was menstrual blood, even if it technically was also irrational to have that thought. But somehow, this was the only rational explanation to me. That everyone, of course, denied having anything to do with that strange liquid. Also, this sounds rational to me because that spot was just so extremely weird, and I believe them. That spot made no sense. We also checked the floor for other stains or smearing, drops, also under the bed. But there was just that one. 
I think in the end our teacher was the one cleaning it up with a handkerchief. The floor was fine with no damage or a hole or anything beneath. So, it didn't come from above. It didn't come from below. It was like it appeared out of nothing. That strange blood-like spot. I say blood-like because I can't confirm, of course, that it was blood. I just didn't and still don't know what could look like that except for blood. Very dark blood. Also, it didn't look like juice or jam or any other kind of food or beverage. There was also no strange smell coming from it. Or probably we just got rid of it quick enough, I can't tell. I also don't think it was a prank. Neither the girls nor the boys were the types, and the boys would have never dared to silently enter our female room with our teacher inside. Well, as told, I am rather the rational type and would love to give an answer for that strange spot, but I can't. Probably there is a simple answer to it. At least, I hope so. I was sitting on my bed with my computer watching a movie when suddenly my Alexa activated listening in the opposite direction of my bed. My headphones are connected to the computer so there couldn't have been anything that triggered it. I took my headphones out immediately and listened. My mom had her show paused on the living room TV and I could hear her in the kitchen making toast. It's not unusual for her to make toast before she goes to bed. Anyways. My Alexa has activated for some reason and I can tell she is listening to something. She deactivated after about 30 seconds of listening, and I went to ask her to turn on my lights. She kept saying my light isn't responding and to check its power supply. I got a little freaked out and used my computer light to see. Since it wasn't too bright, I couldn't see much, but something moved. I scrambled out of my bed into the light switch. It wasn't on. I flicked it on and it didn't work. I did it over and over and it refused to work. I couldn't leave my room without a mask because my parents had COVID. My mask was not on the door handle. I took the warden's sword next to the door and held it in my hands as I flicked the light up and down repeatedly. Slow, fast, and it didn't work. When it finally turned on and was shaking to no end and there was nothing there, I grabbed my phone which was on the floor somehow and turned on the flash. Looking around, there was nothing, not a single trace of someone or something in my room, except my Xbox controller on the floor knocked off its charger. It was late, so I didn't sleep that night. I kept my phone and wooden sword next to me under the covers, held tight in my hands. I rule out the possibility of an intruder because me and my mom are home all the time. My dad is too because it's Christmas break and he has COVID. Nobody could possibly get in without being seen in my small home. I've had more than one encounter with odd occurrences in this same house, but this was by far the scariest. I want to start off by saying that everything I've written down here is true. None of it was made up. I'm not a scary story writer or anything. I just need to share this experience with someone, and I'm afraid of how the people around me would react. Me and my girlfriend like to use recreational drugs sometimes. They're called research chemicals. On Friday, July 29th of 2022, we used some uppers. The ones we used give you a rush of energy but have no psychedelic or hallucination inducing effects. Had a great time and slept it off the next day, both of us waking up late in the afternoon. We had a good breakfast in Netflix and chilled for a while. She lives in a studio apartment and has pet rats, so we can't smoke inside because they have sensitive lungs. The building she lives in has a public balcony, so that's where we went out to smoke about every hour or so. It was a small balcony on the second floor with wood railings and a stone floor, overlooking the neighborhood. 
The building's rule was that nobody was allowed on the balcony after 10 p.m. We didn't really give an F about that rule and neither did anybody else. So we'd smoke there in the evenings too. It was on Saturday night, July 30th, that we went out for a smoke outside. Must have been half past midnight. We were reminiscing about the day before. About halfway through our cigarettes, I suddenly heard a weird noise very far in the background. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and since we were having a conversation, I tried to ignore it. I stopped after a couple of seconds. I noticed it stopped, but paid no mind. When our cigarettes were done, we were still just standing on the balcony talking when I suddenly heard that sound again, and immediately asked my girlfriend to be quiet. Why? She asked. I responded with shh. I was listening to what that sound was, and as it was now quiet, I was able to hear it more clearly. After a few seconds, I realized that I was hearing, and I felt a cold chill run down my spine, like my soul got sucked down through the floor. My whole face went pale. I hear a woman screaming, I said. She laughed at first and jokingly asked if I was high on something. I told her to shut up for a second and really listen. She noticed how dead serious I was, and she turned her ear towards the end of the balcony, and as she heard it, I saw her face turn just as pale. That's a woman screaming, she said. Our first thoughts were that somehow we had accidentally taken some really bad drugs, and had some kind of weird shared psychosis after effect. We immediately checked if we had any symptoms of overdosing or after effects. No sweats, no high heart rate, no fatigue, no crazy thoughts. Both of us were able to think and talk clearly. We concluded that the sound we were hearing, a woman screaming, was real. The reason this struck us was because it wasn't a normal kind of scream. It wasn't somebody getting scared or mugged or whatever. This scream was different. It echoed. It carried a hopelessness in its tone. It sounded so vague and far away, like it was carried to us by the winds. The scream sounded like somebody screamed their soul out of their body and into the sky. Both of us nailed to the floor. We kept listening in silence. Some loud teenager were cycling home probably from a bar or something and screaming at each other. Both of us could finally breathe again. Well, that was the logical conclusion. Just some loud teenagers, she said. I initially agreed. But when they were far beyond what we could hear, the screams came back again. Their sound even more desperate now. I did not hesitate and immediately called emergency services. I explained to them what we had heard and how it had affected us. They told us that they're sending a police car over. We were outside in the parking lot near the main entrance waiting for them, still hearing these faraway screams. The police arrived at a quarter to one. Two officers, a male officer and a female officer, introduced themselves and asked us to explain in detail what we experienced. So we told them exactly what we heard and where we heard it from. The male officer didn't take it too seriously and tried to ease out of it by saying it was probably just mating frogs. Apparently they make a scream-like sound when mating. The female officer took us more seriously and stood with us listening. And very faintly, like whoever was screaming was running out of energy and time, we heard her again. So did the female officer. She immediately contacted the station and they set out a search and rescue. We were thanked for reporting this and they left. For me, it wasn't done yet though. We sat back down on the balcony and kept listening. As we were sitting there, the night sky turned a pulsating blue from all the police cars driving around, trying to find this screaming woman. We sat there just listening to the continued screaming, hoping it would stop when they found her. Must have been about 20 minutes later, almost half past one that the screams finally stopped. My hopes were that the police had found her and she was safe, but deep down I had a feeling that she wasn't. That Wednesday, I was at my mother's house for dinner. She lives in the same town as me. During dinner, I told her what we had experienced and how frightening it all was. My mother stood up without saying a word, walked over to the living room, grabbed that day's paper and handed it over to me. Woman found dead under fallen tree, the headline read. I was shocked. I felt my eyes filling up with tears and said in a shaky voice, I heard this woman die. Against my better judgment, I kept reading. 
The 47-year-old woman was on a midnight walk in the woods last Saturday night when a tree fell over and crushed her legs. Local authorities believe this woman may have survived for several hours before succumbing to her injuries. She had been dead for almost 72 hours before she was found. The police refused to share further details as to her identity or passing. There was more in the article, but I could not, and refused to read it through my tears. I did not have it in me to share this with my girlfriend, out of fear of how she would take it. But that's not the most disturbing part of all of this. I live alone, and sometimes when I'm in bed and can't sleep at half past midnight, I can still hear her screaming. Sometimes my doorbell rings in the middle of the night, but when I go to check, there's never anybody there. I had a camera doorbell installed, and the only thing I caught on camera was the sound of my doorbell ringing. Sometimes I hear a wind knocking sound like somebody is banging on wood. Stuff in my house seems to relocate on itself, such as clothing, food, and tools. My fridge door sometimes opens by itself. Whenever I look at my kitchen door, it feels like something is watching me. My cat Robin seems to stare at nothing in corners, and sometimes even gets a big tail, starts hissing at these empty corners. Ever since all that happened, my TV has this weird thing where it turns itself back on after I turn it off. It's only when I take the plug out of the socket that it stays off. All these things seem to only happen between half past midnight and half past one. The most horrible thing is, I can hear her screaming when it's silent around me. I called my doctor about this because I thought I was going insane. She referred me to a team of therapists. After countless hours and talks and sessions, they confirmed that I suffer from no form of delusion, hallucinations, psychosis, or any other mental illness that could cause me to experience all of this. But I still do. She still screams at me. Last night, January 2nd, 2023, I heard her screaming and banging again. When I went to bed and shut the lights off, I kept having this feeling like someone was standing next to my bed watching me. And so I decided today, January 3rd, that I would write down this experience and share it in hopes that she may find some rest in the knowledge that she won't be forgotten. Since we never got a name, I simply call her the Screaming Woman. May she rest in peace. I'll start this by saying that I'm not into supernatural experiences, and I never gave them much thought until my own experience. This is 100% true, and I would swear on any religion or dead relative that what I say is the honest truth. I grew up in a very old home, for my area's standards anyways. It was built in 1929, coming up on its 100th birthday, by a well-known Spanish revival architect and the area back then was pretty much all agricultural. This particular home was the place built to house the family that owned the citrus orchards in a 10 block radius. Since it was an orchard home, it has some quirks, like a built-in trash furnish suit, goodbye bad report cards, full basement which they use for cold produce storage, and some truly stellar hiding spots. We moved there when I was six years old, to understand the story, I'll give a description of the layout of where my story takes place. The home has what some might call a grand entrance hall, complete with a grand staircase. It wraps around the three walls. The top of the main stairwell is shaped like a giant square. You get to the top landing and you follow the giant square walkway around the rooms consisting of my sister's and my hallway, which has my bedroom, my sister's bedroom, and our shared bathroom and our parents' master suite at the end of the walkway. Pretty much, you have to walk past our hallway to reach my parents' bedroom. My sister's and my hallway can be closed off from the main stairway walkway by shutting a door with the lock. Note, if you don't lock the door, it won't stay shut, as it always swings slightly ajar. Like I said, it's an old home and they have their quirks. The lock was on the inside, so only someone in my hallway could unlock it. 
In other words, no lock access from the main stairwell. When I stayed at home alone, I always locked the hallway door. I was never scared in my home, but it felt better to have that extra layer of protection anyways. To the point, when I was nearing graduation of high school, I was at home alone. My sister had gone to college years before, and my parents were on a weekend vacation to the mountains, which are only an hour and a half drive from our location. It wasn't unusual for them to leave for the weekend since I was already 18 and responsible. I never drank to get drunk, never tried drugs, etc. Sometimes I'd have my best friend come over and we'd watch movies or have the soccer team come over to swim. Nothing was ever crazy and my parents were always polite and never left a mess, so my parents didn't mind if I had people over when they were out of town. On this particular evening, I was alone because I had a soccer tournament the next morning. Now my bedroom door was far left side on the same wall as my headboard. From where my head was on my pillow and laying on the left side of my body, my sight line is directly at the space where people would walk into my room. That evening I was sleeping and woke up to roll over. Nothing crazy in that I usually do wake up a few times every night to adjust. But that evening I rolled over and with sleepy eyes I saw a figure in the doorway. In my sleep haze, I recognized details of this person. He was wearing overalls that had stains on the knees, was wearing a white shirt with sleeves rolled up. His hair was mid-length dark with loose brown curls on them. Now here's the kicker. He waved. Not like a normal person wave, but what I call a tinkle wave. The kind where your fingers go down slightly one after the other and you repeat the pattern. He waved a tinkle wave at me. I closed my eyes thinking it had to be some weird sleep thing where dream world and reality met. I opened my eyes and he was gone. The truly bizarre thing was that I wasn't frightened in any capacity. If anything, there was a sense of calm. I chalked it up to a weird dream and that was that. The next morning I got up, got ready for soccer, unlocked the hallway door, went downstairs and went to my soccer game. Business as usual. I never mentioned it to anyone because who would care? It was a weird dream. No one had been there since the door had been locked. Fast forward to six years after the weird dream. My sister was getting married and one of her bridesmaids, Allie, was from out of state. My family had known Allie for years, so rather than her pay for a hotel, she stayed with us. Since I was on break from college for the wedding, I was staying at my parents as well. My sister's room was a wreck with wedding chaos so I cleaned up my old room for Allie to stay in while I stayed in my sister's old room. The morning of the wedding, I drove Allie, Sarah, another local bridesmaid, and myself down to the venue to get ready. It was about an hour's drive to the venue from my parents' home, and we talked about our old high school, current life stuff, etc. We were about halfway to the venue when Allie mentioned something about not getting a great night's sleep. Being a good hostess, I asked what was wrong and if there was anything she needed since she would be staying in my room for a few more nights before she was leaving. I'll never forget this part. She said, No, it was fine. But the guy in your room wouldn't go away. He just kept waving. Y'all, I almost swerved into the freeway K-rail barrier. I asked her to explain what she meant. Allie told me she woke up around 3 a.m. because her phone dinged an alert. She looked at the doorway and saw a man standing there. He looked at her for a minute and then waved. The tinkle wave. She mimicked the wave to me exactly. By that point, I must have been pale as a sheet. She then went on to describe his appearance. She described him with the same details as my own, except added that he had a bandana in his lower side pocket of his overalls. After this, she and Sarah could obviously see that I was pretty rattled. I told them what I had seen years before in the same place with the same details. As I said before, I had never mentioned this to anyone. Why would I? It was a dream. Allie told me she's sensitive to spirits. She's had many encounters and can feel their energy. As I stated before, I had never believed in any of this stuff prior to this. She even told me not to worry because he was a benign spirit and just wanted to make his presence known. This matched my own interaction because I never once felt threatened, which normally wouldn't be the case with a strange man in my bedroom while I'm home alone. I remember seeing him and thinking that I should feel frightened, 
but I never was. After the wedding festivities and after Allie had left, I asked my mom if she had ever seen anything one might consider supernatural in the house in the years since we had lived there. She's a well-educated ER doctor with a no-nonsense attitude. She told me that she's come home from the hospital a few times, always the 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift, when she generally wouldn't get home until after 3 a.m. after finishing up charts. She said she had seen a shadow man move between my sister and my hallway door. I asked if she had ever felt frightened after seeing it and she said no, that she always felt nonplussed. I told her about my dream and what Allie had also seen. Honestly, she didn't react much besides telling me to stay on good terms with it. Since that first experience, I saw him twice more, both of these sightings being in my sister's bedroom one at the right foot of her bed and the other on the left side of her bed. The last time he didn't wave though. After my mom's revelation, I checked my phone after seeing him and both sightings were between a 3 and 4 a.m. time frame. I don't know what it is or who or why, but it's happened too many times for me to believe that it's not real. I named him Philippe and when random stuff happened in the house, I couldn't explain like my hat falling from the top of my lamp with no window open or anything touching it besides the lamp, I would just say, hi, Philippe, as to not tick him off. What scares me most to this day is how quickly my mind shifted from these are make-believe stories to this spirit exists in my home and he wants to be known. What else is out there that we can't see or explain? There are a few other supernatural stories in this house, but those are my sisters, and I don't want to write a story that isn't mine. I'm happy to say my husband and my home so far has no other tenants besides ourselves and our dogs. I would say that this started when I was around nine. I started getting terrible nightmares every night and would wake up crying or sweating. I shared a room with my two sisters and they told me to talk to our dad about it. I did and my dad admitted it happened to him too and I would grow out of it. The same year the faucets would turn on. We had a connected bathroom to our bedroom. Clothes would fall off of their hangers. Our door would open and slam. My friends and sisters would wake up with random bruises and scratch marks. It was terrifying. Plus, the nightmares never stopped. When I was 13, I had stayed up late watching YouTube, and I was now used to the haunting shenanigans. When things would happen, my sisters and I would just roll our eyes. I was facing my wall when I felt goosebumps and eyes staring into the back of my head. Creepily enough, the first thing I thought of was... It finally decided to show itself. I turned around and I swear there was a shadow standing in front of our open bathroom door. I blinked and it was gone. I kept it a secret as one of my sisters was paranoid and still terrified of the haunting. A year later, 14 years old, my other sister had moved out. So now it was just me and T, my sister, in the room alone. We had stayed up and I admitted to her what I had seen. As I was describing it, she interrupted me and described it in detail. I asked T, how did you know? And she said she had seen it, except it was only staring at me every time she saw it. We both had quickly decided it was after me for some god awful reason. After this, I tried everything, praying, salt, good luck charms, spells, tarot, all of the above. After none of it worked, I gave up. Then we moved and I got my own room. The nightmares got worse and the sleep paralysis started. Once a month, I get the most terrifying sleep paralysis to the point where it's messed up my sleep schedule. I see him in my sleep paralysis. He's there in my nightmares. And I see him sometimes when I'm awake. I tell all my friends that I'm used to it. It doesn't bother me. But yes, it does. 
I want a good night's sleep. I want normal dreams. I want to have sleepovers without my friends being terrified. Every time I see him, I am filled with dread. When I tried to get him away, it became worse. The sole reason I gave up. I cried to my mom about it and she said, ghosts aren't real, you'll grow out of it. It's been nine years. I never grew out of it. It hasn't gotten worse or better. He's just there. Please help me. What do I do? Five teenagers, all around 15 years old, in an isolated area frequented by various homeless and drug-dependent individuals at 11 p.m. Sounds like a fun night, right? So to start, I'll say that this night and what I experienced definitely affected me in how I look at and think about certain situations. About five years ago, Myself and four friends decide that we'll be asking our parents if we can stay out past our usual time. Those who had to ask. Being that it was the beginning of summer and the school year was over. So we all met up and are just kind of walking around aimlessly, talking and thinking of what we were going to do tonight as the sky fades from blue to a beautiful orangish pink collar. As the sky turned dark with not a single star shining, We arrived at a school that happened to be having a mural painted on one of its huge walls. In front of the wall is a large metal scaffolding type structure. Me being dumb and reckless decides to climb it because why not? After getting to the second to top platform, so three platforms up, I asked my friend on the ground to snap a pic for me. After all was said and done at the area, once we decided to leave and made our way down into the subway, which we hopped and then got onto a train and decided to ride to our next destination. The train ride was honestly the best thing about this night looking back. We were goofing around in this empty train laughing, swinging on things, crossing through the different train cars, just being absolute hooligans. The train arrives at the stop, and a few friends are suggesting that we hop this fence and explore the subway tunnels. To this suggestion, I get a feeling that I'd be very familiar with after the events of tonight. That feeling is dread. I shoot down this idea immediately, saying that it's a bad idea and we leave the subway. Back on the streets, it seems even darker out, due to there being more space between streetlights around this area. We enter this big park. Honestly, I'm not sure what to call it. It's really a large area with a man-made lake being a local focal point with woods and other smaller bodies of water scattered about in the outskirts and a road that circles around the main area. We walked around in the wooded area until we realized the flashlights had seriously been killing our phone batteries. So around this time, I'm feeling a weird feeling, like we should be out of there like yesterday. I keep a calm attitude, brushing it off as anxiety. Mistake. But do say that we should probably start walking to an exit, which we do. The route we take is to the side slash back exit, Now in the back end of the park is where it switches up a bit. The back end of the park is different in a few ways than the rest. Unlike its wavy, turn-filled counterpart, the back road was almost completely straight, which made it look much longer. Also switch out trees and greenery with a highway that runs parallel right next to the back road. Throw in filth and a skate park underneath and there you go. You now have an image I had stuck in my head for a good while. So here we are walking down the back road, as my friend Gabe and I have a dumb, no, the dumbest idea. Let's scare everyone. Thinking on the spot, we go into the highway and easily find some broken wood for whatever reason while not being noticed. We toss the wood, causing a loud echoing bang. We come running out, explaining that we were being chased. And to our surprise, it worked like really well. They start running down the road and look back and scream bursting into a sprint. So we're pretty amused at first until the screaming part. 
That's when we turned around to see some homeless man who looked to be high on something jogging towards us. I remember he was wearing a dirty, worn out purple shirt. We thought it would be a good idea to not run because standing our ground or something. But I don't know if that was the best choice. The man jogs up and behind us, then begins walking between the two of us and put his arm around my shoulder and like pulls my body around jokingly, saying something like, Hey, buddy, what you doing back here? I don't think I responded, and if I did, I probably told him to get off of me. So his playful shaking me with his arm on my shoulder turned into him getting me into a chokehold from behind. I'm not sure how, but I threw this grown man off of me and onto the ground, then proceeded to run away. The story goes on longer, but that's enough for this post. Thank you for reading. So a little background on myself. I'm a 20 year old female college student on break for the holidays. My parents took a short four day trip out of town. So me and my sister, who was an 18 year old female, got stuck on dog setting duty. We have three Cavalier King Charles Spaniel dogs, two females and one male, all in between the ages of one and two. The male named Cheese has an obsession with these rubber balls some background on cheese his behavior could be described as erratic and hyper he's the type of dog to chase shadows lights flies obsessively lick us and just has always been a little more stranger than our other two dogs in other words he has a very obsessive erratic behavior one of his obsessions is a specific type of rubber ball that he loves to squeeze in his mouth as it makes a squeaking sound It's the only toy he has that he is majorly obsessed with. We've bought him a handful of these balls because they go missing occasionally. They roll under furniture or get lost outside. After a certain amount of time, we put the balls up in a designated spot, a flower pot up on a mantle in Cheese's view. Because if not, he will literally chew on his ball all night or tear up the couch looking for it if he does not see us put his ball away. This particular weekend, he has had the same ball the whole time because we've kept it near for when he decides he wants it or up in the flower pot for us to easily find where it is when it's time to play. Typically, the ball will roll under the couch in the living room multiple times while he's playing. We go through the same routine where he scratches at the floor to let us know the ball is rolled underneath. We're able to get the ball with a designated back scratcher. It has a long arm that extends that we use specifically to recover his balls that have rolled under something. In addition, we use a flashlight to see the ball because it's a dark area under the couch. All weekend, my sister and I have been retrieving this ball for him as it's a normal occurrence in our house that the ball will roll under the couch. However, we only saw this single ball every time we went to retrieve it from under the couch. There were no other balls under the couch. We had not seen any of these other balls the entire weekend just the one that he had been playing with. The other handful of balls were unaccounted for. Last night, my sister and I put on a movie for the night around 9 p.m. Around an hour and a half into the movie, I look over at Cheese and he's not acting like himself. He's acting extremely calm, too calm for his normal erratic behavior. Cutting the movie short, I carried him outside to go potty and just cuddled him all night because I knew the poor guy wasn't feeling good but I knew he just needed to sleep it off. Like I said, his ball is his favorite toy, so I took that ball and put it next to him as he slept, just to give him more comfort. I turned off the lights in the house and cleaned up the living room and headed to bed with him and the two other girl dogs, who were completely normal by the way. Cheese was the only one acting different. They're very attached dogs, so the girls sleep under the covers by my feet and didn't move positions all night as I do wake up during my sleep a few times occasionally and could feel them still there. 
I also would check on Cheese as he stayed put in the same position with his ball next to him all night. Now this is the unexplainable part. When I wake up, Cheese is completely back to his normal erratic self. I get up, grab his ball, and put it in my hoodie pocket to give it to him after he's finished breakfast. He won't eat his food if he sees his ball. I walk out to the living room and on the floor right next to the couch there are three of his balls in a triangle formation setting there. Remember, I was the last person in the living room last night after tidying it up and there was nothing there. I go to my sister's room to ask her, Hey, did you find three of Cheese's balls and put them next to the couch last night? She responds, Um, no. We were the only two people in this house. So who found the extra balls, and why were they all gathered next to each other? I know it couldn't have been one of the dogs because they were with me all night. Keep in mind, there were no extra balls under the couch, and these balls were unaccounted for all weekend. So now I have four of these balls, including the one that he has had all weekend. Where did these extra balls come from? Who placed them there? I haven't seen another ball in days. I keep raking my mind trying to think of a logical answer, but I cannot. This is truly unexplainable, and I am creeped out. I never lived in a haunted house, but my mom did as a teen. Other houses on her street had strange things going on too. A few homes away from her lived a family. One night, the daughter went to bed with a headache. The next day, she was dead. She'd passed away from an aneurysm. After the funeral, the family went away to get their minds off of the tragedy. The father asked my uncle, my mom's brother, to check on their pets. My mom and dad, who were dating at the time, went with them. My mother heard that there was a grand piano and she wanted to play it. My dad was studying to be a veterinarian. After entering the house, my uncle and father decided to go to the basement to see the animals, and my mother went to play the piano on the ground floor. She was playing it when she felt something brush her ankles. She thought that a cat must have left the basement and walked past her. She kept playing and then she felt it again. She looked under the piano and saw nothing. When she started again, she felt hands clasp her legs tightly. She dashed to the basement door, called my uncle and father and waited for them. Back outside, my uncle could tell my mom was rattled and asked what was wrong. She told him what had happened and he turned white. He told her the daughter who had died used to play a game with her father. When he played the piano, she crawled underneath, grabbed his ankles and pushed his feet up and down the pedals. When I was 22, I moved into a house with the most unwelcome experiences. I refer to it as the Devil House. It was a small three-bedroom rental home with an attached garage. It took no time before I felt nothing but uncomfortable. I felt like I was being watched 24-7. Every time I took a shower and closed my eyes to rinse my hair, I saw a young native woman with long black hair. She always appeared wet. Not too long after that, long black hair started to come out of the seams of the shower. One of those bath fitter type showers. That lasted the entire time I lived there. It got to the point that I would fight to rinse the shampoo and conditioner from my hair without closing my eyes. I had the worst nightmares I've ever had there. Mostly of death. The most terrifying one was I had walked into the back bedroom where there was a body under a white sheet. I lifted the sheet and up jumped what I can only describe as Satan. Bloody skin, sharp, jagged teeth, emerald green eyes and ram-like horns. It seemed so real and I can still envision it like it was yesterday. 
I had a cat there that I ended up getting rid of because I was getting ready to have my first baby. After that, I kept hearing cat bells rattling. But it obviously wasn't her. I found two in my closet upon moving out. One night, I woke up to a quiet buzzing sound. I got up to go to the bathroom where I noticed these flying bugs that would climb halfway up the wall and in the hallway and fall to the ground. Lying back down, the buzzing became more intense. I turned on the light in my bedroom to see literally hundreds of them. I called the rental office to report this. A guy came and said he found no signs of anything. No kind of infestation or anything. It never happened again. I would hear whispering every time I opened the garage, but could never make out what it was saying. I would stay there as little as possible, like literally only to sleep and shower. A few weeks later after having my daughter, I was too scared to stay there anymore. I worried about her. I continued to pay rent and bills until my lease was up, but stayed with my parents for three months until I moved out and got an apartment. About a year later, my best friend's sister-in-law lived in a house in the same rental community where her house ended up catching on fire while she was outside smoking a cigarette for maybe five minutes. She told my best friend when she opened the door and saw the flames. I felt nothing but evil. Coincidence? I don't think so. This will be my first time sharing this experience. Any feedback will be appreciated. I am a building service contractor and have no experience in storytelling or writing. I'm just happy that I found a place to share. Thank you. I have no explanation for any of the things I witnessed. I have never seen anything like it before or since. I do admit that I have never in my life felt so helpless. I was alone. No one else that I know of saw or heard the things I did. I did manage to get some shoddy video with an iPhone. I still have the phone, but it's crushed, and I have no idea how to recover any media. I am 44 years old now. My experience happened. Early in the month of June 2018, around 2 a.m., I had just finished work for the day, and it was a beautiful night. I had the windows of my Ford Econoline van down, enjoying the country air. I live pretty much right in the middle of Iowa. A nice house on 27 acres. My shop is on one side of the driveway, the house on the other. Large oak trees, larger pine trees, and of course, a yard light. Neighbors across the road maybe 150 yards away. More neighbors across the creek. Anyway. As I'm pulling in, I see maybe three or four sets of eyes under or at least near my porch. Nothing super unusual, as I have from time to time a family of raccoons try to settle that close to the house. I notice the eyes and that must be the reason I didn't go straight inside the house. I figured I'd stop in the shop to grab the 22 just in case I got an aggressive mama coon. Before I step out of the van, I notice how full and bright the moon is, above the tree line directly west of me. As I sat and appreciated the scenery, I watched the moon go across the sky, like it would only in fast forward. This I videoed briefly. Maybe there's a legit reason the moon appeared to make it three hours of movement in two minutes, but at the same time, the moon appeared to be still and normal. I shut off the camera on the phone, and then I hear this very unusual and very loud sound of large pieces of concrete being moved. I can't say that I saw large pieces of concrete moving, but I heard it and was very focused on this as this was not a normal thing to hear out there. So as I'm trying to justify seeing the moon move and fast forward and knowing I just heard my driveway open up, my thoughts are maybe there's an earthquake or a sinkhole or I'm having some kind of episode. Still in my van, windows open. I remember the eyes that I saw when I first got home 15 minutes prior. But as I go to get out of the van, I see a huge thing 
move towards the house coming from where I heard the concrete moving. Not only do I see something huge, I hear the noise that I will never forget. I have no idea what I saw and struggle to find the words to describe the noise it was making. But as I'm fumbling for my phone, trying not to move too fast to get noticed and keep an eye on this huge thing that is in the shadows. But when this thing roared, it sounded like a mechanical dinosaur slash bear slash warthog slash giant bird screech. I froze, literally frozen in fear, and I just witnessed, before the ungodly roar slash screech, this thing reach up and run its hand or paw or claw. I can't explain it, I guess because I didn't see it long enough to comprehend, but it stood from the ground with one arm or wing extended up from the bottom of the second story bedroom window. I shouldn't say it stood, it was walking, but that's the size of the thing. It did not move gracefully, but it didn't move loudly. Like, when it wasn't roaring, I did not hear its movements. I have no idea where it came from, but the way I processed it, it moved the driveway apart and came from underground, walked up to my house, ran its hand or whatever along the bottom of my daughter's window, screeched at the house, got behind my van and screeched again. I say screech, but it was a lot more than a screech. At this time, I gave up the idea of running to the shop for a rifle. I had a feeling that this thing came for something, but I don't know why. I could have busted in my house, tore it apart if I wanted to. Anyway, when it was behind me, I had my phone recording. I did not get a visual of this thing with the phone, at least not a clear shot. You could see a large thing moving and hear the noise but I pulled out of there and drove straight back into town. The first lit up place was a car wash where I pulled in and rocked back and forth, so confused of what everything was. Soon as the sun came up, I went home. I only had a feeling that it came for something, and the way it made the noise made me think it wasn't there to harm my daughter. I say that, and although I felt it wasn't there to harm Tiana, I only felt that I thought that. I can say that I left with the intention of leading it away from the house, but I was helpless. There is nothing I could have done to harm the thing or protect my only child. I know I witnessed something I will probably never understand. I can't bring myself to speak about it to my daughter or anyone else close to me. I showed the video to some people, but did not explain to them what they were looking at. Because every time the thing made a noise or was in view, and even when the moon was moving, the audio would become super distorted. It sounded like you were on the other end of a phone that someone was holding out the window driving 80 miles per hour. I don't know how to process this experience. I wonder, was this a demon? Was this my imagination? Did I lose my mind for an hour? Where did it come from? Where did it go? What would move concrete that big? What the heck was the moon doing? And whatever happened to the raccoons that I saw? If it was my imagination, how do I explain the video? I witnessed something. I mean, I saw, I heard, I felt the ground shake, but I will never understand. Like I said before, I'm not a writer, just a guy from Iowa wondering about some crazy night. I own and operate a company. I speak to my employees and clients daily. I am active in my community, and as far as I know, people have never questioned my sanity. Anyway, thanks. It's been a while since I posted a story about a self-unaliving house, but I have had several requests for more stories about my experience in the field of trauma scene work. If you don't know what that is, I used to lead a crew that would go in after a murder, self-unaliving attempt, unattended death, accidental death, fire death, or any manner of incident that caused damage to a structure that left behind a scene that the victim's family shouldn't have to see. 
Now, I know my stories are not scary in the haunted house or serial killer type stories, but the fact is, most people couldn't handle walking into a scene like many of the ones that I've been on. We actually had to be very careful of how we trained crew members who worked in such scenes. It was often a volunteer basis for working on those types of scenes, meaning we didn't force anyone to go to a house where the dad killed all the children before blowing his brains out in the lazy boy. We just didn't start someone in training and then go, oh, by the way, we're going to a multiple homicide. Anyway, if there was a way to describe some of the sights and smells of doing this type of work, I am sure you will see how truly scary or messed up this all is. First of all, I have to say that self unaliving is not glamorous, nor is it ever over for those around you. If you need help, please get help. Don't let your loved ones find you that way. It not only changes them, but changes the feeling inside the house. Anyway, back to my story. This took place in the late 1990s, just before I got out of the field. We got a call to dispatch a crew out to a house, and we were told that there was an incident with at least one death. Sometimes it's given to us this way, but never like a real whole story. But sometimes we saw the true story on the evening news or a neighbor that talks too much. We arrive at this house, modest house, not really a high-end home, but not a low-end either. It was a two-story home, about midway into the cul-de-sac. As with some scenes, there is a cluster of neighbors outside looking at who we are and why we were there. The sheriff's department had just released the scene, so all of the crime scene investigators had already done their job. As I approached the house, I noticed a ton of what looked like bullet holes in the stucco, broken glass, and a long blood stain on the driveway. We went inside and had to suit up almost immediately as the police had probably used tear gas. There were blood stains all over. It looked as if someone had been dragging through the house with blood gushing. There were areas that had pulled up blood. Areas where things were kind of looked like explosions happened to which I assume flashbangs were used, or maybe the guy inside had shot up. Probably what strikes you the most in situations like this is how benign the underneath looks. I don't know how to describe it, but just imagine, if you will, a place looking like the inside of a home molded out of the TV set of Full House. Now imagine the same TV set with blood smeared and pulled, bullet holes, and tons of broken glass. I mean, they seemed like a very normal family. I remember in their living room a big blue wood cut sign that said family. You know, before live, laugh, love signs were in style. And under that sign was a bunch of family photos of kids, parents, Christmas, graduation, and vacations. Other things in the house was a wall dedicated to the dad's love of his sports teams and pictures of him with his buddies at games and stuff. So what happened? From what we pieced together from the news reports, neighbors who wanted to talk to us while we were cleaning his blood off the driveway, and from its scene itself was that the dad went crazy. He had been talking about demons a lot. Like, I got my own demons, but actual demons. He was sure that he was being attacked by the devil and that demons were trying to take the souls of his family. So rather than to let the Damons take his family, he killed himself, and so they would go to heaven. He ended up barricading himself in the house. It looked like some of family members tried to get away after being shot and stabbed. But one collapsed in the kitchen, and one escaped somehow, and one was pulled out by the police. He ended up shooting back at the police, and the neighborhood was evacuated for blocks. Not sure about all that as we arrived on the scene much later. But that was what the people outside were saying. In the end, he escaped the house, ended up on the roof still shooting back, and the police, and they shot him. He fell from the roof, and that was his blood that we were cleaning from the driveway. He murdered his wife. One of his older children later died in the hospital. One of the kids was killed inside the house. One escaped, and I think another family member that lived with them was unharmed as they were not at the house when this all went down. It took us a lot longer to clean this scene, as there were so many holes, and we had to remove almost all of the carpet and soft surfaces due to the tear gas. 
It was a terrible scene inside. I know this might sound religious or whatever, but come across enough of these scenes and you start to really believe that evil does exist. Here's a bit of context that gives an idea about the place this had occurred. Part of my childhood was spent in the tri-state of Arizona, in a small town called Topak, a few hours from Death Valley and Area 51. So to cut it short, I've seen some crazy stuff that I still can't explain to this day. I was in middle school and was around 12 or 13 years of age. We were constantly bored and looking for bad kid things to do. So one day we have a friend tell us that there was this creepy house with weird objects inside and we should break into it after school. This sounds like a blast. And I proceed to go after school with a group of friends. There were maybe five of us, all within the same grade or a grade lower. The initial impression was ominous. Even in the middle of the day with the desert sun, the one story house lay surrounded with dirt, which wasn't unusual for a house there. But it was completely broken down, missing tiles on the roof, completely dirty, and all the windows in the front door were boarded up. A hole was made in the lower half of the front between two boards, so we all slid in through there. The first room is very dark, but not pitch black. It's a kitchen covered in dirt, empty except for a cardboard box overflowing with broken baby dolls, those really nice ones made of porcelain. One in particular had a broken eye that was staring into my soul, so that already had me on edge. The one room that was actually pitch black was to the right, and a living room with daylight to the left. No one had brought a flashlight and cell phones weren't something we had around that time yet, so we all chose left. The living room was very well lit. There were proper curtains that were faded to a very brownish yellow. It had a complete set of furniture including a TV and had another room to the left. It was a bedroom that had a full size bed made with a comforter and pillows. I remember being terrified for a moment that I broke into someone's actual house and had to reaffirm with my friend that it was abandoned, which he confirmed that it had been for over a year. I found two large scrapbooks on a nightstand and took them to the living room to read since the room was giving me weird vibes. At this point, half the group went outside to check out a dugout basement on the other side of the house. The first book was huge and was entirely full of pictures of one dog, a border collie. There was no owner in any of the pictures. It was all of this one dog. It was crazy. Multiple pictures on each page, and it had maybe like 30 pages. The other book was about the same thickness, maybe bigger and was filled with news clippings regarding UFO sightings and encounters. My mind was having trouble processing and trying to find a link between these when someone called us from the kitchen to check out the dugout outside. We dropped the books and went to see what could be even weirder than what we just saw. About 15 feet from the house is a square, maybe 6 by 10 feet, of thin wooden boards. And there's this dug-in staircase to the side with small satellites on the ground surrounding all of their cords leading beneath the cover. This looked like a hair could collapse it, so we all took turns lying on the dirt and poking our heads inside, which was hard because we only had the light from the opening to peer in. It was entirely made of dirt and had wooden shelves built in it. A small table laid to the right with radios and stereos of all sorts on it, all covered with dust. On the shelves there were mason jars caked with dirt, that had visible liquid at the tops of the jars near the lid. I was dying to know what was inside, but we all could only guess. We all decided to head to the park and had agreed to come back the next day. I didn't go the next day, but instead went the day after, and by then the group had doubled in size. But that day when we got there, caution tape was secured toward the edge of the property. There were about four men wearing black suits with white shirts and wearing sunglasses talking. We were tripping to say the least. First off, suits in this weather of a hundred plus? 
and we had all seen the very popular Men in Black movies with Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones. We didn't dare talk to them and left home for the day. We went back that weekend to see what had changed and arrived to nothing. The house had been completely bulldozed over and the dugout filled in. We all talked about it for years afterward, but I still don't know what to think. Maybe the guy got abducted or knew too much and was arrested. Either way, pretty sick true story. I saw a post a few minutes ago with a picture of what appeared to be cult activity. Looking back at that picture stirred a not so distant memory. For context, I visit my mom every few months and she lives a few states away from me. I was driving back from visiting my mom and was less than an hour or two from the Oklahoma-Texas state line. Driving, I enter a small town that I have no knowledge of. The only thing I remember clearly about it was there were a few medicinal marijuana dispensaries and it had a lot of old buildings. Almost all of them with large old fences and gates. I can't find this on a map. If y'all have any ideas, please let me know. Now, on to the creepy encounter. I drove into town already feeling creeped out. The residents would shuffle about and stare. There were very few new buildings, but that wasn't the creepy part. On almost every sidewalk corner and road, there were dead dogs all wearing a leash and collar. No blood, no slashes, bites, or gunshot wounds. I stopped at the one traffic light in the town and took in the greater picture. The people, as I just said, shuffled and just seemed wrong. Then the horror hit me. There were 20 plus dead dogs. There was no logical reason or conclusion for this to happen. One or maybe two would make sense, but it was 20 plus. Almost every lawn there was a dead dog. Not just one breed in particular. It varied from miniature poodles up to Rottweilers and Labradors. I noticed no one seemed to care. It was not just one. There was no way of ignoring it. But again, they all had leashes and collars. And I can't emphasize this enough. They were actually everywhere. They were on street corners. Yards. In the middle of the road. Parking lots. Everywhere. I drove through the town with no issues. Also, I attempted to find the town before writing this down. I still have no luck finding it. Next time I go up to see my mom, I'll attempt to track this town and possibly give y'all an update. My theory is either a cult or a major meth or drug epidemic in that town. If you have any information or ideas of where and what happened, please share it. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. My name is Innerscare, and you can follow me on Twitter at Innerscare Sleep. Also, make sure you check out the podcast linked in the description down below. I hope you enjoy the extra rain at this video. Good night, everybody.